Our Bob Rose lecturer today was born in Melbourne and started incredibly adult life as a primary school teacher at the prestigious Wesley College. Predictably, it didn't last long. He found himself working at the Melbourne Theatre Restaurant at the last laugh. And so it all began, the career of Brian Nancurvis. Originally, perhaps best known for his character, Raymond J. Bartholomew, an eccentric poet who appeared in the 80s and 90s on the Hey Hey at Saturday show, and of course also appeared on Hesse's Shed and introducing Gary Petty. Brian also played the role of Dr. Ray Good in the stage and TV versions of Let the Blood Run Free and was an integral part of the sketch comedy series Jim Owen. He frequently appeared as himself on television and stage and uh, certainly was an integral part of the panel and thank God you're here. Brian and his wife Sue collaborated on the ABC documentary Boys and Balls starring Roy and HG, Ted Witten and Ron Barassi. And most recently, of course, Brian co-created, he produces and he stars in the SBS music trivia game Rock Whiz. It certainly has been an amazing hit. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the 14th annual Bob Rose Lecture, would you please welcome highly acclaimed writer, creator, producer and, of course, football nut, Brian Nancurvis. Thank you very much. Delighted to be called a football nut, a Brazil nut, an almond, a cashew. Look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Uh, I would like to pay my respect uh, to the elders, the traditional owners of this land, and also, ladies and gentlemen, pay my respect to the RACV club this hallowed venue in Melbourne. As my friend Julian said, we are here amidst all the tall buildings with an incredible view. It is customary to begin any after-meal speech at the RACV with three food-related jokes. Joke number one, how do you know someone's a vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> Joke number two, why doesn't Elton John eat Cos lettuce? Because he's a rocket man. <laughs> and number three, joke number three, and it's a particularly Melbourne joke. Uh, if Bert Newton was a butcher, how would he introduce his wife, Meat Patty? <laughs> We're off. Ladies and gentlemen, seriously, I am honoured and delighted to present the 2016 Bob Rose Lecture, saluting the academic and the cultural aspects of football, raising money for a wonderful cause, and saluting a fine man, an honest man, an upstanding and gracious man, who just happened to be a childhood hero of mine. That's right, Bob Rose was in charge of the Collingwood football team on one of the darkest days of my life. September 26, 1970, as a Collingwood-obsessed 14-year-old, I sat with 121,695 other spectators as my world crumbled. Let me take you back courtesy of a diary entry that I could easily have written. <laughs> it's the 28 minute mark of the final quarter of the 1970 grand final. Jezelenko gathers the ball and snaps an amazing goal. All around us, cocky Carlton fans erupt in a nauseating display of pathetic barracking. The dazed Collingwood army turns even whiter with shock, horror and disbelief. Something so good has suddenly turned so bad. I'm 14. I'm sitting high in the northern stand with, my, with Deanna, my cousin from Brisbane. Deanna took me to the second semi-final and she'd enjoyed that victory 
without really understanding its importance. This Collingwood team was ready to break the drought of the 60s. In that decade, when I'd fallen head over heels in love with the black and white jumper and all the magic that it entailed, we lost three grand finals. The second semi-final win in 1970 was but a stop on the road to triumph. But two weeks later, a 44-point lead at half-time has been squandered in the face of Barassi's desperate handball manifesto and a blonde mop-top kid called Ted Hopkins who came out of nowhere and hung around long enough to kick four goals and set up that victory. The siren sounded, booming in my small brain and a smug Carlton supporter behind us jumped up and yelled out for all the world to hear, up yours, Tuddy. <laughs> this was the final straw. <laughs> I turned around, looked at him, and I spluttered a feeble, get stuffed. <laughs> and promptly dissolved into floods of hot tears. I was led away by Deanna and her speech therapist friend Leslie with cruel Carlton laughter ringing in my ears. Later that night, Deanna and Leslie were meeting boys at Popper's Pizza in Turak Road and they invited me to tag along. I nibbled morosely at my plain Jane pizza and I gulped down Fanta. Carlton supporters filled the dance floor as they grooved a whole lot of love and spirit in the sky. I wondered how I could forget this crushing defeat and front up again next year when most of the restaurant began chanting na na, na 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 na, kiss a premiership goodbye. <laughs> I didn't have, think I'd have the strength for another season. Well, I did. I fronted up. I fronted up the next year, ladies and gentlemen. But if I am to be honest with you, and surely if the Bob Rose Foundation is about anything, it's about honesty, not quite with the same passion. I was there in 77 for the draw. In 1990, I was filming Let the Blood Run Free out at Nunawading, and I tuned in. But something was missing, something. Not quite the same passion, the same obsession. These days, apart from teaching my son to kick with both feet, watching him develop into a handy ruck rover, and coaching him at St Kilda City for three years until he took me aside and said, Dad, enough with the coaching. <laughs> enough with the bad jokes. Enough with the speeches that no one understands. <laughs> My main passion these days, from a sporting point of view, is actually playing football. To be accurate, doing circle work. Every Wednesday and every Sunday for the last 20 years. We wear proper boots and we buy new Sharons and we go at it pretty hard. And I love it. Now, I can't tell you too much about it because it's kind of a secret society and the numbers probably need capping. But let me quote from one of our founding fathers, Paul Kelly, writing in his best-selling cookbook, How to Make Gravy. <laughs> You've got to be careful. Paul writes, and this is from his cookbook, from his memoir, a mongrel memoir, I think he called it. We have no leader. We have no official status. We are builders, taxi drivers, comedians, artists, opera singers, writers, teachers, anaesthetists who simply love football. We love this great game. We love playing football. We run kick, bounce, lead, mark, handball, call and banter for an hour or so until we swagger and stagger to a stop. There are no teams, 
no uniforms, no scores. There is a defibrillator in the ball bag. <laughs> we do not tackle. We do not compete, though once in a while a few fellas fly for a mark or someone tries to sell a dummy. We are simply trying to execute simple things perfectly, to drop the ball sweetly on the boot and watch it lob with pretty spin into the hands or the chest of the leading man without him having to check his step. Lace out. To be on the receiving end for the same result, running flat out for 20 or 30 metres to take the ball in outstretched hands and deliver a precise hand, paint, hand pass to your mate who, timing his intersecting run, now calls for the ball. We are cogs in a smooth, well-oiled machine, stringing a sequence of possessions together that somehow feels like poetry looping the leather round the oval without touching the grass, once, twice, three times, never too long before the inevitable error. But no matter, we pick it up and we start again. Round and round we go in pure pleasure. One ball and 20 or 30 or lately 40 men at physical prayer in their outdoor church making the thing that none of us can make on our own. As Paul said, we do not compete. It doesn't get physical, but we are fair dinkum. We are driven by a deep love of this great, great game. We do have special activities. We have an Anzac Day kick, a Father's Day kick, a Golden Shorts Day in September, a champion kick in October where the judges wear Bruce Andrew masks. <laughs> and we have a pie night every December, which includes a best and fairest count, video presentation, and a completely ridiculous and quickly forgotten AGM. <laughs> Three years ago, at one of these pie nights, I dug out a beret last seen on Hey Hey It's Saturday, and I recited this poem. Oh, kickers, kickers, city slickers, bang bangers, yin and yangers, weekly trackers, baggy dackers, midweek whackers, crazy cream crackers. Deep within us, there is a yearning, an aching, a deep need that we must heed, a funger we must feed, a hunger we must feed, a lead, a lead, someone f***ing lead. <laughs> we fan out, voices ringing in the Elwood air, darkness falls, time slows, the bull sticks, the sun sinks into the bay and we slip away. Close my eyes and I can hear my mother call me in for dinner in those deserted streets of North Borwen. Open my eyes and I follow the beautiful Red Sharon, trusting in these companions and this fluid dance, this meditation, nostalgia, team, tribe and trance. I travel by bike, I drive or catch a tram. I kick torpedoes, therefore I am. <laughs> 21 years. 21 years we've been kicking and I'm hoping for another 21 before I take up lawn bowls. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave you with a final look back at the past, uh, my football past, hopefully a past that is familiar to many of you in this room. Uh, a simpler time, 12 teams, Bruce Andrew and the champion kick on World of Sport, Uncle Doug handing out footy francs, roast chicken and two editions of the Sporting Globe a week. <laughs> and one of them was pink. <laughs> of course, there's something beautifully innocent about the past, particularly when we conveniently leave out all the bad bits. 
we eulogise and we mythologise and we put on rose-coloured glasses, Bob rose-coloured glasses, when we look back at the pleasures of the past. And why not? If there's one thing I've learned from spending the last 11 years making the RockWiz program on SBS, it's that the past can be a refuge, an oasis, an escape. We ask on the RockWiz show, we ask contestants to name their first concert and their first record. And night after night, we watch their eyes widen and their hearts swell with pride and joy as they proudly announce their own firsts. Sherbet at Box Hill Tech. Johnny O'Keefe at Festival Hall. Midnight Oil and the Divinals at a Stop the Drop concert at the Maya Music Bowl. Just for the record, and I was asked as I made my way in from uh, Burke Street and raced up the elevator, someone did say, what was your first concert? <laughs> it happens. Uh, the Kinks uh, at Festival Hall, uh, 1971, I was in year 10. Ray Davies came out and he said, your government has just banned our latest single. We're going to play it twice. <laughs> and they did. And then a third time as an encore. The song was Lola. And I've now got an 18-year-old daughter called Lola. <laughs> the first records I bought, I joined the uh, Australian Record Club. I got the best of the Who, Bob Dylan, Highway 61 Revisited, and Simon and Garfunkel, the soundtrack to The Graduate. I didn't know much about Simon and Garfunkel, but I love the picture on the cover. <laughs> the first single I was ever given on my 11th birthday, Warren Higgs, my best friend, I'd worded him up. He knew what to get me, and he arrived at the house with Snoopy versus the Red Baron. <laughs> Do you remember? By the Royal Guardsman. Sing along with me if you can. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 or more. The bloody Red Baron. Thank you, sir. The bloody Red Baron. And that was the trouble because Warren's mother, Beth, was a good woman, a God-fearing woman. And when she found out that the word bloody was used in the song, she said, this cannot happen. Brian's parents are similarly God-fearing. They are conservative. I am going around and I will seize that single. <laughs> she came to the house and she seized it. And I'll never forget, she stood on the porch at 256 Doncaster Road holding my beloved single in the air. She said, I will replace this with something more appropriate. True to her word, she came back the next day with a replacement single, Jake the Peg by Rolf Harris. <laughs> She was not to know. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, as an affectionate and grateful nod to the Rose family and the wider Collingwood family, I'd like to read from a story I wrote when my son was born. I knew I'd accepted the fact that I'd lost touch with my inner barraca, and I wondered if young Henry Joe would grow up loving Collingwood, feeling excited about the black and the white. And here's what I wrote. I've been Collingwood since the cot. My dad barracked for Collingwood. He was taken to Victoria Park at the age of 10 and watched Nuts Coventry run rings around Richmond. Dad spoke about his Collingwood heroes with reverence. They were decent men a credit to their families and the club. One night over crumbed cutlets and soft peas, he told us about a new business associate, the great Collingwood wingman, Thorold Merritt. Dad said that Thorold was a complete gentleman, a well-groomed, courteous man who could stab kick the ball like a rocket. Dad set up a target in the backyard and I combed my hair 
and I practice my stab kicks, keen to master this mysterious art and determined to please my dad. I read everything I could find on Collingwood, but nothing matched the power of going to the games. I went to matches at most of the grounds, drenched at Windy Hill, squashed at Moorabbin and frozen at Cadinia Park. At Glenferry Road, I made the mistake of admitting I barracked for Collingwood to a Hawthorne fan with a Scotch College blazer and a powerful right hook. <laughs> but none of the grounds could match the atmosphere of Victoria Park. There were many trips, but the first is indelible. Dad parked near Dites Falls and we walked around the ground, past the railway station, and the social club with that massive magpie on the wall and fleeting glimpses of ancient portraits, honour boards and wooden doors into hidden boardrooms. Through rusty turnstiles we went and up crowded concrete paths, past huge men buying beer and raucous kids kicking footies in the dirt or kicking rolled up bits of paper in the dirt. Pies, pretty girls squealing, crumbling toilets overflowing, up some stairs and onto the terraced hill behind the goals and whoosh, there's a primitive roar, a vast sea of heads and the Collingwood reserves kick another goal and it's sunny and Dad finds a couple of cans for me to stand on. Cigarette smoke rises in clouds and finally our team runs out and Dad and I cheer and he lifts me high and we roar as our black and white heroes do a lap of the emerald green grass before handing out a wonderful thrashing. <laughs> My bedtime stories were divided between New Guinea and Victoria Park. My dad had seen service in the Second World War and had a repertoire of jungle combat stories. Treatment for malaria, prisoner of war tortures, and my favourite, eye contact with a smiling Japanese sniper who wasn't fast enough for my dad. But I had to work hard to get him to tell that one, and the awkward silence that followed was usually filled with Collingwood tall tales and true, a half-time address from Coach Fonts Kine, Murray Wiedemann kicking a winning goal after the siren with a broken ankle, or Lou Richards putting mercurochrome on his boots when he was feeling kind to the opposition. <laughs> Fueled by these tales of valour and heroism, I drifted off to sleep, often in the midst of my own heroic football fantasies from deep within the 60s. Just imagine dreamy music now and the scream shimmering my dream. I'm selected to play for Collingwood in the grand final against Richmond. <clears throat> Peter McKenna has done a hammy and club talent scouts remember me from a junior game against Ashburton when I slammed on six goals in the final quarter. On grand final morning there's a photo of me polishing my boots on the front page of the sun under the headline, Magpie Magic. Teenage Tearaway Takes on the Tigers. <laughs> I'm in the changing rooms early. I'm stretching and I'm signing autographs for the bald boot stutters grandchildren. Coach Bob Rose insists I lead the team onto the MCG and I crash through the banner wearing Peter McKenna's number six. It's a bit big, but I'm proud. <laughs> Freddie Swift welcomes me with backhanders and cracks about my mother's personal hygiene. <laughs> but by half time, I've kicked five goals. I've shut Royce Hart out of the game and I've given Len Thompson a hand in the ruck. But Richmond come back strongly after the break. Billy Barrett and Dick Clay are unstoppable. And at three-quarter time, the scores are level. 
We eat orange quarters handed out by short, angry men who pace nervously around our huddle. Bob Rose speaks calmly and then Tuddy takes over. He's bleeding from every orifice. <laughs> but there's fire in his eyes and magic on his tongue. The siren sounds and for the next 31 minutes the lead seesaws madly. Collingwood are fabulous. Graham Jerker Jenkin runs the length of the ground before goaling from the half forward flank. Colin Tully, Colin Tully sharks the ball from a centre bounce and goals with a towering drop kick to the punt road end. But Richmond is determined and somehow at the 28 minute mark they are only five points down. Suddenly, Roger Dean is paid a free kick in the Richmond goal square. Oh, no. <laughs> He's been niggling Tuddy all day, and finally, Des has had enough. <laughs> he flattens him with a shirt front. <laughs> but Dean kicks truly, and with time running out, it's Richmond by a point. Umpire Crouch bounces the ball and the Collingwood fans are stunned as it races back towards the Richmond goals, but our defence steadies. Laurie Hill bursts through a pack and sends a wobbly punt towards John Greening, who sidesteps Kevin Bartlett. Blind turns and shoots a long hand pass to Barry Price. Price looks towards goals and sees my lightning lead. He takes the best option. His stab quick is like a bullet and I take it in the chest, high in the air. The siren blows and 120,000 people explode, then fall silent. I'm 50 yards from goal, on the boundary, alongside the Collingwood bench. Bob Rose is flanked by various club legends, Tommy Sharon, Thorold Merritt, Jock McHale. They're all tight-lipped, ashen-faced and frozen with expectation. Peter McKenna hobbles up to join them. <laughs> Shaggy mop of hair, big eyes, crooked smile. He gives me a nod and motions for me to use a drop punt. I walk back slowly, pull up my socks and unleash a beautiful drop punt which sails between the big sticks and into the grandstand. We've won the grand final. I'm carried triumphantly around the ground, a hero, a legend, a kid from North Borwen, proud to be wearing the mighty black and white. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.